I want to thank you for uh, for worshiping with us. And, and we have a God who loves us. And I want to remind all of us that uh, each and every day, God goes before us and makes us aware that he loves us. And I pray that you know that. I uh, just want to uh, welcome you again for, for being here. I want to pray with you that Pastor Steve's going to come and he's going to share with you some announcements and a word as we come before the Lord today. So, Father, uh, today I know that we are here in your presence. And Lord, I pray that we would be reminded again and again that we are not here by mistake, but you have drawn us here. Um, Lord, I pray that today as we worship you in person or as we are logged in, Online, or maybe we're hearing this a little later. Lord, I pray that you would uh, help our hearts to be turned to what you have for us. And Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I wish you all a good morning as well. And uh, boy, what a beautiful, beautiful morning it is to gather to worship. Um, uh, as far as announcements go, we have our uh, East Michigan Conference uh, annual meeting, our annual conference is coming up uh, this weekend. Uh, it is on Saturday. Uh, there is a, a, a portion that will be meeting in person, but they also will be uh, uh, live streaming the conference meeting, the annual conference meeting. And so uh, Saturday morning uh, at 8.30 is when it begins, and there will be a link on the church's Facebook page uh, for anyone who would wish to tune into uh, all or a portion of um, of that, and uh, it's not as boring as it sounds, uh, an all day meeting. Uh, it is uh, much more worshipful uh, than anything else, uh, as those who have attended uh, can tell you. Uh, and so, I'd encourage you to uh, to check that out, uh, even if it uh, even if it be briefly. Um, and for sure, uh, I would ask that, uh, that you would spend time uh, in, your, in your prayers uh, this week, praying for the conference, praying for the direction of the church as well. Um, I want to share with you uh, from the uh, 138th Psalm, uh, and it is a Psalm of David. Uh, it says, I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth and they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Uh, and so as we, as we stand and sing songs of praise to God this morning, and as we hear uh, of him and we hear from him and from his word this morning, uh, I would encourage you to think of, of, of the words of that song, giving thanks with our whole heart, uh, bowing down towards his holy temple. We often forget that our God uh, is a holy God, uh, that he is God Almighty. Uh, and so I encourage you to, uh, to stand and sing uh, with that in mind, with that uh, on your heart this morning. I just want to take a minute before I pray to testify that 45 years ago today, I accepted the Lord as my Savior, and I had no idea. I had no idea at that time, I was almost 20 years old. Uh, what a difference my life would be. And, uh, you know, when I was contemplating, the year after that, I was contemplating getting married, and I was wondering about, what am I going to think, well, oh, somebody's going to do this, you know, my job isn't that great. And the Lord gave me a promise out of Matthew 6, that says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you as well. 
And I got to say, 45 years later, God has never let me down. He's been faithful, and uh, I praise Him for that. Amen. Awesome. So, uh, anyway, will you pray with me before Pastor Phil comes? Father God, we want to thank you for the gift of salvation. I want to thank you for the Holy Spirit that works in our lives when we think there's no way. And Father, we just pray that you will work through this message today, that your anointing will rest on Pastor Phil, that we will take heart to your word and what you've said. And we thank you for your faithfulness that you never fail us. And we give you all praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dave. Uh, God's grace is good, isn't it? And it goes before us. It makes us aware of who God is and his love for us. Uh, this past week, for a lot of this past week, Pastor Steve and Michelle were on the ministry week. And Steve's going to come and share for a couple minutes what God's putting on his heart. And I want us to hear... Um, to hear this and just uh, give God praise for what He's doing. So. Yeah, it's pretty awesome to uh, have just uh, proclaimed the words, I will never be the same again. And to hear uh, Dave share a portion of, of his testimony uh, 45 years ago, Dave, uh, since then, you have never been the same. Uh, and uh, and that's an awesome awesome thing and and many of us uh, have similar experiences and uh, surely as we walk with God uh, we continue to have experiences that uh, that leave us never the same um, and uh, so this week that we're uh, this this week that we just concluded I guess depending on how you think of the calendar. Um, I was able to accompany uh, my wife Michelle and uh, the rest of the staff from the, uh, the Life Choices uh, and Options Resource Center, uh, the Pregnancy Center in West Branch, uh, to Columbus, Ohio. Uh, that was tough, tough ground for me as a diehard Michigan fan. Uh, but it's a beautiful city, really. Uh, and uh, uh, we went down to uh, a conference, an annual conference, uh, that is uh, put on by Heartbeat International. And Heartbeat International is a, uh, a resourcing organization for, uh, for pro-life pregnancy centers, pregnancy resource centers uh, across the world. Um, and I stand here because um, I'll never be the same again. I took uh, midweek, I don't know if it was Wednesday or Thursday, um, during the keynote address from the, uh, during the lunch time period, uh, I took a picture from the back of a very large uh, meeting room, uh, arena, uh, whatever formal name ascribe to it and uh, texted it to Pastor Phil and I said there are over 800 people here gathered in the name of life and um, the Holy Spirit was in that place in a profound fashion and the way I know that is because the Holy Spirit was ministering to me in a profound fashion uh, tired and weary workers um, were gathered together for encouragement and equipping, as is and should be the purpose of the church in this gathering. For tired and weary workers gathered for encouragement and equipping. And there was many challenges put forth by uh, by speakers that are in leadership roles at Heartbeat International and by speakers that they brought in like uh, uh, Nicole C. Mullen and uh, the lead singer from the band We Are Messengers and uh, Brad Stein and uh, uh, a, uh, a nun, Sister Deidre, and I can't think of her last name. Uh, many of you may, may know of her if you say uh, the nun who was in the army and uh, is a surgeon, uh, and she spoke at uh, a Republican National Convention um, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and uh, many others who repeated the call and the importance to understand that 
you cannot separate faith and God and life. You cannot separate that. You cannot have faith in God and not be pro-life. And I'm not talking about a political disposition. I'm talking about a posture with which we view people uh, in this world, whether it's the the, the pre-born or whether it's the uh, expected moms or whether it's uh, uh, any of us who are gathered today or our neighbors or the people that we encounter day by day. Those pre-born babies are, in many instances, like the injured and wounded man on the side of the road. And people walk by. And there are few who stop to help. Those mothers that are in extraordinary circumstances Whether they be teenagers or not even that old, or whether they be, um, I think, uh, you know, Michelle will call me sometimes and say, hey, will you pray for this client we have coming in or this client we have here right now? And I, and I think of one that wasn't too terribly long ago that was a woman in her 40s that already had children and just couldn't bear the thought of uh, another pregnancy and another child due to a wide variety of circumstances in her life. Any imaginable situation. The fathers who are on the other side of that equation, who don't know what to do, or maybe they do, but there's a, uh, a, a damaged or a fractured relationship with the mother, and, and, and they're unable to have a voice, or they're unable to, uh, to, to, to be fully alive and present in that situation. And the message that I heard loud and clear, being there not as a, uh, a nurse or a, a client uh, a patient advocate or as a director or in any capacity from a pregnancy center, the message I heard loud and clear from the people that were in the individual breakout sessions to our keynote speakers. is that those who are on the front lines of this pro-life movement are hungry for the engagement of the church. And often, uh, I don't know about you, but often when I, when I hear something that feels critical, I get defensive, and my immediate reaction was, yeah, but. And I started thinking about the context of, of, of our specific congregation, right? You know, yeah, but our church is, is has been uh, very active and very generous in, in uh, raising funds and supplies for the pregnancy center. And, uh, and, you know, we host Right to Life and, you know, all these different things, right? All these different justifications to say, you know, hey, we're in the fight. But then I started to listen. Listen to the men and women who are speaking. Listen to God, who through his Holy Spirit was speaking to me. And realize that there's still a huge, huge gap. Funds are important. We sit in a church and we understand that. We understand that, you know, there's bills to pay to keep the lights on and the, and the heat going and so on and so forth. We understand that it takes volunteers. We understand that. Uh, uh, it requires uh, prayer and uh, some other things. We understand some of the practical aspects of it. 
just from being a part of the church. But we think about that teenage mom who's scared. When you think about that overwhelmed, you know, 30 or 40 year old mom who's scared, when you think about uh, uh, all the other relationships that are involved with, uh, uh, you know, their parents and other family members, when you think about uh, how the, the, the father is involved and where they, they may be at, there's so much more to being pro life than counseling, then pregnancy tests, then ultrasound, then parenting classes. Because just like I once was, just like you once were or maybe are today, these are extremely broken people. And out of their brokenness is what has them in the situation they are in. And out of that brokenness, the, uh, the pregnancy center and the people involved there do amazing things to try to bring wholeness and health and life into that situation. But the reality is, the only thing that's going to bring health, the only thing that's going to bring life to the full is Jesus Christ. And for sure, the women and men involved at the pregnancy center represent him and speak of him in those brief interactions. But a pregnancy center is not where we go to be spiritually nourished. It's not where anyone goes to be spiritually nourished. And so church, it is time to rise up and instead of merely speaking of being pro-life or taking a political stance, it is time to rise up and live pro-life. Live pro-life for babies. Live pro-life for, uh, for expecting parents. Live pro-life for today's parents and grandparents. You know, in Titus, it talks about uh, how older men need to instruct the younger men. I'm looking at it out here at some of you today, and I know there are more online, and I'm looking for men who will stand up and show up and say, I'm going to be pro-life in the lives of men who are struggling. We need to do that, church. Men, we need to do that. Titus also gives the same charge to women. We need women to, uh, to, to show up in the lives of younger women and encourage them and instruct them and help them along the way. In church, we are the place where there are women who uh, have and are experiencing life in Christ and understand the change that is involved and how amazing it is we need you to stand up and show up in the lives of women of all ages who are in need of life. One last thought. I'm borrowing this from a TikTok video of all things. Words I never thought I'd say. Could anyone tell me or show me a scripture that encourages or directs unsaved people to come to church? I know you can because it's not there. But the New Testament is full of scriptures that tells the church to go to unsaved people. 
Church, we need to stand up and show up. Well, Pastor Steve was talking about life, and so I just felt the Spirit just kind of lead me to speak about life as well. Yesterday I had the privilege to be on a Zoom call from Iraq that was prayer for um, our, some of our Free Methodist people with Impact Middle East who are there um, working in Iraq with refugees among the Yazidis, uh, survivors from sex, sex slave, um, those kind of folks. Anyway, um, a couple of the guys have been working on um, uh, social media uh, on an evangelistic site, and um, there had been 11 suicides in the previous week, and they were really concerned about this, and they um, put, just put out on their site, just said, is anyone considering suicide? Um, write to us, we'd love to talk to you. And they have been inundated with hundreds and hundreds of emails from these people in the refugee camps that are desperate for life. Just the day before, so that would have been Friday. They had 127 messages that came to them. And these people, there's only six of them to answer these calls. And they're um, not even sure how to go about it. They're like, none of us are psychologists or anything. And um, we're just trying to answer And They're talking to these people who have such hurts and such deep hurts. And so it's, it's a cry there, too. We were all praying and crying out to God for life. The same kind of a cry in the midst of the despair and the hopelessness crying out for life and I just wanted to ask you all if you would just pray and remember these people because they are needing um, our prayers so much to just help build them up and give them wisdom and discernment about how to answer these cries that are there that the fields are white with harvest and they they need people to just intercede and pray for these people um, will you pray with me just for a moment Father God, we just cry out to you for life. Thank you that you are life in the midst of despair and hopelessness, that you bring that life to uh, uh, those who are seeking you. We pray for our brothers and sisters there that are trying to minister to this great need. I pray that you bring them wisdom and discernment and um, help them to be able to touch these hearts that are crying out, that are seeking you. And I just, uh, I thank you, God, for what you can do, and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You know, when you, uh, each week when I prepare a message, I never know what's going to happen. But God always honors the preparation. Uh, we're looking at, we've been, we started a series uh, a few weeks ago now, God's Amazing Grace. And God's grace said, is at work, God's grace said, is a free gift that's extended to us. Today's focus is on God's invitation. It says in, uh, before we go further, I need to pray. So Father, today help me to handle your word in a correct manner. Lord, your Holy Spirit is here with us, and I don't want to uh, diminish that in any way. And I'm reminded that I need your help to correctly handle what you have impressed upon me that is of you. So Lord, I ask for your help in this, in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1 John 1, 29, the Bible tells us that uh, when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. How was it that John was able to say that and discern that before Jesus ever went to the cross? This is the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. It's toward the beginning of it in the first several months. And he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He discerned that it would be through the Lord Jesus Christ that grace would be extended to us. And that he would do for us what we could never do for ourselves. That he would bring this tremendous invitation to participate in his love in a, in a, in a way that we could never do on our own. Because God loves us and he values us. You know, Jesus um, took my sin 
and he extended his grace to me. And he's done the same for you because he loves you. Lord Jesus became, you know, became sin for us. I've heard that all my life. And I don't often, sometimes hearing I didn't often understand it. Or we hear it so often, sometimes we, we forget to pause and think what that really means. But because Jesus loves us so much, he values us so much, he became that which makes us separate from God. And he allowed it all to be upon him and did for us what we could never do. Went to a cross for us. But after preparing this message, I didn't realize it was David's spiritual birthday. I've heard his testimony many times. I've been here, you know, for a while. And uh, I know his birthday is this time of year. And every every year that since I've known Dave, he always remembers this day. He says, Today is my spiritual birthday. Today is the day that I understood that I needed a savior. And I didn't understand all the whys, I didn't know what it would mean, but it, but I was drawn to that. The Holy Spirit drew him to that, and he gave his heart to the Lord, and he's never been the same. God's grace was working in him, drawing him to that place, and then drawing him to receive him because Jesus loves him. And he's been experiencing life, and he hasn't been perfect, he can tell you that. None of us have, but God's grace has been working in his life. And God's grace continues to work in his life. And, and um, Pastor Steve, when he was when he texted me a couple times this week, I could tell the Lord was doing something in his heart. You see, there are those times in our life where God just revitalizes us and makes us aware of our need for him and makes us aware that he is inviting us to something more. The question is, what will we do with that? How will we respond? And, and this is what I know this morning. God has an invitation for each of us to be participants in his grace that is at work in us. Right. What will we do with that? We, we, uh, we've been looking at some things about God's amazing grace and how his grace works. And living in God's grace is about embracing all that God has for us. Living in God's grace is not this. It's like, it's not if I said, well, you know, I gave my heart to the Lord and there's some there's some things that you know, I really want to do. They may not be God honoring, but I just want to experience them because I want to do them. So I'm going to do them. And the Bible says Jesus forgives me, so I'm just going to do what I want to. He's going to forgive me because I'm saved by grace. That's not walking in grace. Okay? That's a, that's a walking, uh, taking advantage of God's mercy and his, his long suffering, patient character but that's a dangerous way to live because you're refusing God's grace that wants to work within you and accepting God's invitation is to not to refuse what he wants to do but is to embrace what God wants to do in your heart and in your life so living in God's grace is about embracing all that God has for you knowing that he wants what is best for me and what is best for me is to be in his will and his purpose and to be following him. What is best for me may not be comfortable in this life. And we have to be okay with that. And I am okay with that because when I follow Christ in his will, I have the greatest peace I could ever have. We, we have been made in the image of God. And we need to be mindful that every person, every man, woman, and child, every young person has been born with this desire to know God. When God gave you life, he gave you this desire. We have something within us that draws us to him. We all have enough faith to believe. And some people say, well, I don't feel like I have enough faith. You do. If you have enough faith to believe, a light will come out when you flip the switch. You have enough faith to believe that Jesus is your Lord. Because he does the work within you. Grace from God, His amazing grace, makes us aware of, of our need for Him and our love for Him and gives us the, uh, all we have to do is begin to say yes. God's amazing grace allows us to walk in a saving relationship with our Lord and Savior. 
Apostle Paul talks about it in, in Romans 6. I just want to go there quickly, so and I want to look it up, so I share it right with you. But in, in uh, his letter to the Romans in chapter 6, I want to go to verse 22. I'm sorry, Romans 3.22, Romans chapter 3. It says this, Paul writes, This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul says, look, he says, he says, we believe in Jesus Christ because we put our faith in him. And it's for all who believe. It's not selective. Jesus doesn't select certain people. He doesn't say, I value this person more than that person. His salvation is for all who we believe and all who we trust in him. And there's no difference. We're all in need of a Savior. I was watching an old interview um, of the Johnny Carson show from 1973, so it was a minute ago. And he was interviewing Dr. Billy Graham. And in that interview, he, uh, he asked uh, Billy Graham about going to heaven and about what it means to be a sinner. And Billy says, he says, look, he says, uh, he says, I'm a sinner, we're all sinners. And he says, and all of us have broken all the commandments. And Johnny says, what, all the commandments? I'm even trying to, I can list all the commandments. And Billy says, I'm sure you could if you tried. But he went on to explain that, that breaking the commandments of God doesn't have to be that we physically carry out it. It has to do with, with what's in our heart. But then he says this, but there is a Savior. And he's faithful and just, and he loves you. See, God's grace goes before. God's grace works in our life. We can embrace God's grace, and he gives us this invitation. So Paul says this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. To all who believe there's no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by his grace to the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God calls us and he's, he's done the work for us to walk in this saving relationship with him and he gives us this great invitation. You know, an invitation, I want you to think about a formal invitation. A formal invitation is a request to be present and to participate in something that is of great importance and significance. And it feels good to get an invitation, doesn't it? You get invitations, sometimes they're all fancy. This is we, we honor the present, your presence at this whatever. It has great wording, right? And you can, I want to be there. We have this invitation from God to participate in His grace, to allow His grace to abound in our life. God, who is the creator of all things, God, who is the Almighty, God, who is righteous judge, God, who is holy, God, who knows my past, but has forgiven me, he invites us. To participate in his grace and to know him more and more. God has made us for the purpose of walking in this saving, right relationship with him. So a big part of what God's grace is, is God has continually extended his love to us. Since the fall of mankind, God has continually been extending his love for us that we might receive and we might know what it is to walk with his grace. I want to go to the Gospel of Luke, Matthew, Mark, and then Luke. I want to go to um, the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to be in chapter 14 today, and uh, starting in verse 1. Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 1. This is part of, uh, Luke gives us several examples of Jesus meeting with individuals, oftentimes meeting with uh, Pharisees and teachers of the law, usually on the Sabbath. After their time at the synagogue, it was, it was in their culture uh, highly likely that teachers, rabbis, would be invited to share the discourse around a meal, and they would debate the teaching from the day at the synagogue. You know, uh, probably some of you do that on Sunday mornings when it's done. You go have brunch somewhere or lunch somewhere, and you talk about uh, your pastor in positive ways. <laughs> but. Uh, and Luke records these for us, and, and, and in that time and space, a lot of people would follow Jesus, and the crowds were growing, so as he would be on his way, or he would be gathering, sometimes people would actually listen to the discourse and be part of that, of that time and that learning. 
So Luke chapter 14 begins this way. It's one of these conversations. It says, One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts of the law, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But he remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him away. And then he asked them, if one of you has a son or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will he not immediately pull him out? And they had nothing to say. I mean, you notice how the guests picked places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do you take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited? How awkward would it be to go to a wedding to have an invitation to sit down at the table met for the bride and groom? Right? Excuse me, Phil. Uh, that's kind of a place that's not for you. You need to move. Right? How awkward would that be? Or to sit at the table that's set aside for the grandparents and the brothers or sisters. And have someone get I'm sorry, Pepper. When you go to those things, you you pay attention. You say, where where should I be seated? And if you're not sure, you sit at what looks to be, you know, a humble place. You know, and where and that's what Jesus is saying. So He's talking about that. He says, you're not taking the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host will, who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this man your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place so that when the host comes, he will say to you, friend, move to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of your fellow guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, when you, gain, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, your rich neighbors. If you do, they might invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, invite the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus says, you have an invitation to share the gift of God's grace. And don't share it expecting a return or expecting reward. Share it expecting that God can be glorified in this. I want to go back to the beginning of this passage. The Bible says that when they're arriving at the place, there's a man there with dropsy. Dropsy was a, was a skin disease, and it was thought that this skin disease was, was there or present because this man and sin sexually. So this man was there with his physical condition, and he, and he would have been considered an outcast. He would have been one of those individuals, oh, just, just don't pay attention to him. He might embarrass you, he might say, he might make you uncomfortable. And Jesus says, he asks this question. He knows that, that everyone knows this guy is there, but people don't want to pay attention to the need that is there. He says, he says, now let me ask you a question. Is it awful to heal on the Sabbath? And they don't know what to say. Because they know this. All the law hangs on these two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. See, God calls us to be others focused. God calls us to participate in this grace that is at work in us, where we are always considering how might God make his love known and revealed to, to someone else. Where we know God is able to heal and restore what's going on in a person's life. So Jesus heals him. Then he talks to him and says, look, if you have a son and he has trouble, aren't you going to help him? You know, this the Sabbath? You're going to help him, right? What was Jesus saying? He's saying, look, this, this man is loved by God. God cares about him. And you should care about him. You should love him. God's grace is a restoring grace. It's a restoring grace. And, and, and you might think, you may be listening this morning, you may, you may be online, you may be hearing this message later on, and you, you may think that you carry scars in your life from maybe your own actions and your own choices and your own decisions that make you too far from God. Or 
you have things in your life that make you unwanted by God. Or maybe there have been people in, in your life in the past who have even said you don't matter or communicated to you that no one would miss you. So you may carry with you emotional wounds or hurt from the past, maybe caused by your choices or perhaps caused by someone else. And you believe that you are unworthy and unlovable. I want you to know that that's not true. God's grace is for you. Paul said it's for all people. Second chapter of Luke, the angel said today, the son of David, a Savior has been born to you, which is for all people. Whatever it is in your past, Jesus still died for you because you're all people. You are loved and you matter to God. You are worthy. You are worthy of His love. We are all worthy of His love, not because of what we've done. Not my own. I'm not worthy on our own. None of us, none of us could do anything to atone for our sin. None of us. But because of Jesus. We can know what it is to come before him and to have that same relationship to accept that invitation to participate in God's grace. So I want you to hear me. God loves you. I want you to hear me. God loves that person whom you think could care less about God. He loves them. I want you to be mindful of the fact that regardless of what you think you know of a person or see in a person, that you don't know what goes on in their mind when their head goes to the pillow at night. We've been saved by grace and we walk in God's grace in the same relationship with Him, and He invites us to participate in this grace and to say yes to what He puts on our heart. To say yes to, to, to doing that which, which promotes the love of Christ. They have the courage to say, Church, God's put something on my heart. And I want you to respond, and I want you to, to hear what He's put on my heart. Then Jesus says this in verse 15. It says, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. I look forward to the kingdom of God. I look forward to going to heaven. There are people there I want to see. But I'm reminded in this, as Jesus is going to teach, that the kingdom of God begins the moment I accept him as my Lord and Savior. I'm part of his kingdom now, and so are you, because John says that we are heirs with Christ. Jesus said a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is not ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I just bought a field, and I must go see it. Please excuse me. I know there's a big banquet for it, but I gotta, I gotta see this field. Another said, I've just bought five book of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. I gotta go do a test drive for it. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant go out quickly, go out quickly into the streets and alleys in town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, said the servant, what you have ordered has been done, but there is still room. You know there's room for you in the kingdom of God. He'll never run out. And the master told the servant, go out from the roads and the country lanes, make, then make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, then one of these men who are invited will get a taste of my life. Well, Jesus says, this invitation is for all, and I desire that they would come. Jesus calls us to be mindful not to refuse his grace. 
There's this invitation to participate in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and to allow his grace to be active in our life where, where I will I can think of my love for God and my love for others first. And think, well, where does that put you? I can tell you this. When I love God and love others first, and that's a priority of my life, the way I care for myself improves greatly. Yep. My spiritual health improves. My physical health improves. Do you know I eat better food when I'm thinking about other people first? I can't explain that, but I do. I think it's because of this. When I become selfish, I try to cope with my selfish, bad, stinking attitude, so I want to eat an extra ice cream to comfort me. I think that's probably a pretty solid thing. But when I think about there's other things that are better in my life, you know? Because that's how God made us. As a little kid growing up, he would sing us a little song called Joy. I couldn't spell it very good, but I could spell joy. You know, and Jesus and others in you, what a wonderful way to spell joy. And I won't say it because I cannot think of the tune. <laughs> and you know what I hate it anyway. People go, well, that's a terrible song to sing, tell a kid to sing. Well, wreck his self esteem. No, but help his self esteem or your self esteem. Best way to have joy is to know that I love God first and foremost, and I know that everyone else is loved by God. And I'm going to seek to be someone who loves him as well. And I will find the peace of God in that. It's hard to embrace things that are not of God when you're loving who God gave life to. So Jesus extends this invitation to us to be mindful, not to refuse his invitation. And in my life, I refuse the invitation God has for me. There have been times where I've just missed it. So I've been asking you to write some things in your journal last week. I asked you to, to remember to be mindful to write some ways in which God's grace has been active in your life in the past, the way God's grace is active and working in you now, and how God may have you pray or consider how you may extend his love to others. Today I want you to think and to do some inventory in your journal this week about what might it look like to refuse God's grace. Am I saying yes to God's invitation would be another way to put it. Am I saying yes to God's invitation? How, how is, am I saying yes to how God would have me to respond to others? God's grace is at work in my life, and I know the benefits of his love in my life, but um, is there something in my heart that God wants to deal with on a deeper level? Is there an issue of surrender? Is there someone I need to ask to, to walk with me, to pray with me, to help me with that? Perhaps God is putting something on my heart to say yes to in a new way. How may God have me do that? So I want to ask you this week just to take some time with God and to pray, get out your journal, and just to write down how am I responding to God's invitation? And begin to pray through those things. And pray through those things till you know you're saying yes. Till you know you're responding the way you would have. If you're able, let's, let's stand together. Let's, let's pray. Father, you're a good God. And Lord, I thank you. Your presence is here in this place today. I thank you for new life in you. I thank you for uh, the way your Holy Spirit draws us. And I thank you that we we have those um, those celebrations, those days where we can say, hey, I've been walking with the Lord now for some time. And he has shown me he's been he's proved faithful. Lord, I thank you for those times where we're where we're in a, in a place, in a space where we where we are confronted with the truth of your love and what you do and, I, and you, you, you put something on our heart that affirms for us not only what we're doing that is right but affirms for us a call that you, you call us to engage in a deeper level. Lord, I thank you for reminding us today that you are the author of all life and that you love us and that um, 
that as followers of Christ, your grace is extended to the world around us because we are willing to interact and go to people and to share with them in love what it means to follow you. So Father, I pray that this week, as we, uh, as we pray, as we spend time in your word, as we consider your invitation and your great, amazing grace that is at work, Lord, I pray that you would help us to consider the invitation you extend to us and help us to consider how you would have us respond. And Lord, I pray that we would say yes to what you are doing in our life. Lord, I love you. Lord, I pray that every person here, every person who hears this message know what, knows what it is to say, Lord Jesus, I have surrendered my life to you. And Lord, if they don't, I pray that even now that they would come before you and say, Lord, I believe that you are Lord of all. And I know I'm a sinner. So Lord, I'm asking you to forgive me and to cleanse me and to change me and I will walk and follow you. Lord, if someone is praying like that, Lord, you are faithful, you are forgiving them. Lord, I pray that they would know that they can reach out, they can contact us, and we would be happy to walk with them. Lord, thank you for meeting with us today, and we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name.